Hi everybody, this is Unit 11, which is the lymph system. We're going to talk about blood typing, uh, the functions of the lymph system, how lymph uh, forms and how it's moved, and then mostly we're going to talk about the immune system, the three levels, and how active and passive immunity uh, works. All right, the lymph system is maybe the least well-known. The only real lymph organ is your spleen. Um, and even that you can live without. You might have trouble fighting off infection, uh, you get sick a little more easily, but you can actually live without it. The rest of the lymph system is a one-way system of tubes that basically lead back to the subclavian veins. You can see the right lymphatic duct and the left, uh, on the left side is the thoracic duct up at the near the neck of the figure. Um, that's where the lymph fluid dumps back into the blood. And along the way are lymph nodes, which act like little filters. You can see a picture of a lymph node here. Um, as fluid goes through it, it cleans uh, white blood cells there, clean it, get rid of the bacteria, broken cells, or cells that have become cancerous. So the lymph system, again, one-way system from the extremities and your gut and everywhere else. Um, eventually leads to dumping into the back into the blood. So when you talk about the functions of the lymph system, okay, you have maintained fluid level because it returns fluid to the cardiovascular system. And also uh, the digestive system, dietary fat, goes through the lymph to get to the blood rather than going directly from your digestive tract into the into the blood. So it's a more indirect. And we'll talk about dietary fat a little bit more when we get to the digestive system. But the main function of the lymph system is on the left side here, protecting the body. And you can see the nodes again, or the green dots in this figure, as the lymph moves through up until it dumps into the, to the blood, it goes through those nodes. Um, lymph fluid is clear. It looks like plasma, okay, without blood, because it doesn't have blood cells in it, or it doesn't have red blood cells in it. So it's kind of a clear yellowish fluid that's the same as interstitial fluid. You've probably seen it if you've ever had a blister that's filled with, with pus. The clear liquid part of that um, is like lymph fluid. And when the blood moves through the capillaries and some of it gets pushed, some of the stuff gets pushed out because of blood pressure, not all of it gets back into the capillary. Some enters uh, into the lymph system just passively as pressure builds up here. It kind of slips through these flaps and into the lymph vessel. And like a siphon, it, as because it's dumping into the blood at the subclavian veins, it kind of just moves. Okay, so fluid moves through the lymph vessels passively. There is no pump. And if you analyzed it, it would look just like plasma, except it doesn't have red blood cells in it, and it doesn't have the large plasma proteins in it. And again, it moves very passively, kind of like a, a siphon. There's a couple things you can do, though, to make lymph move a little better. And one of them is move yourself. Walking, uh, taking deep breaths, just moving around helps move the lymph. So when you feel like you're going to get sick and you want those white blood cells in your lymph system to catch all the bad bugs, you should actually take a walk. Not hard, not hard exercise, but moving around helps move the lymph. There's also backflow valves in lymph vessels to help prevent uh, fluid from going back the other way <laughs> due to gravity or, or whatever. Um, but really, moving around is the best way uh, to move lymph. Uh, here's a picture of a lymph node. Again, they act like giant filters. Uh, they're located all over, and when you're sick, white blood cells will congregate there and cause them to swell. That's why a doctor might feel in your neck, you have a lot of cervical lymph nodes, or under your arms, you have axillary lymph nodes, even have lymph nodes in your elbows. Uh, so they're located in the, a lot of lymph tissue is located in your gut and in your respiratory tract because the food you eat and the air you breathe is not sterile. Um, so lots of lymph, well, you don't even think about it, and it's hard to see on a cadaver because it just, it's clear or looks like a hunk of fat or something. It's not as easy, uh, as noticeable as blood vessels are. 
So that's pretty much the function of the lymph system except for the immune system, which is pretty much the rest of what we're going to talk about uh, in this unit. A couple of words you need to know the definition of before we get into the immune system is number one is pathogen. In this talk, a pathogen is anything that causes disease. Almost always pathogens are bacteria, viruses, fungus, parasites. It's a critter. Okay, but technically a chemical that causes a disease like benzene can exposure can lead to leukemia. That can also be considered a pathogen. Contact is when the pathogen gets in or on you. And pathogens enter different ways, but uh, food poisoning, for example, comes in through the mouth, usually on food. Um, pneumonia usually comes in because you breathe in that virus or bacteria. Um, some disease you catch from mosquito bites, for example, so it comes in through the skin. Um, so there's different ways we can contact, but the moment that pathogen touches you, gets in or on you, it's considered contact. Sometimes it goes right off of you. Like if it lands on your skin and falls off later, you didn't even know it was there. But if the bug gets in you and starts to replicate, um, that is called infection. When the pathogen enters the body and starts to make itself comfortable. Sometimes you don't even notice this or it's not noticeable right away. It might take a little while. For example, chickenpox virus, you can breathe that virus in, but you don't actually notice red spots or itchiness or fever for about two weeks. Sometimes we call the infection time the incubation period. And it varies with lots of different uh, bugs, right? I mean, food poisoning is within hours and leprosy takes six months before you notice. And so it's good to know the infection period, like COVID just happened. We know that people that are exposed to COVID, usually within three to seven days, they get the disease. So that's why they knew that we needed to quarantine that long before we could come back and interact with people because we would be contagious during that time, um, right before we notice the disease, which once you notice the signs and symptoms, you are considered diseased. Okay, so there's contact when the bug gets on you. Infection when it's making itself at home and you might not know you're, you're infected at that point. But when you notice signs and symptoms, that's considered diseased. The difference between a sign and a symptom, a sign is something you can measure. You can see it or measure it like a fever, blood pressure, heart rate, redness, Okay, but symptoms is something a patient will tell you. Um, I feel achy all over, or I have a headache, or I am in pain. We do not have a, a measurement for pain. We try, right? We do that on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being the absolute worst. Okay, but we can't measure uh, pain like we can a heart rate or breathing rate. But together, those signs and symptoms is what leads a doctor or medical professional or whatever to diagnosis. Think how hard it is to diagnose a baby because they can't tell us what's wrong. They can just scream, right? Or somebody who doesn't speak your language or somebody who's uh, unconscious. Sometimes it's harder to tell. Okay, so now you know the definitions. Basically, the immune system has two ways to fight off inf infections or fight off pathogens. The non-specific defense systems are considered your first and second line defenses. These defenses fight off any pathogen, doesn't matter what it is, whether it's bacteria, fungus, whatever. The first line defenses are physical barriers or chemical barriers that literally help prevent contact or at least help prevent the bug from staying on you. The second line defenses are more internal and they're all triggered by inflammation. So we're going to go over those first, and then the other one we're going to talk about is the specific defense system. This is considered your third line, and hopefully the first two keep you alive long enough so the specific defense system can get kicked in and fight off the bug. These fights off specific pathogens. So if you are infected with salmonella, the specific defense system, when triggered by that, bug will only fight off salmonella. Later, if you eat E. coli or another bug that causes food poisoning, you're going to have to trigger the specific defense system again to fight off that one because 
it's a specific defense system, is only against one particular pathogen at a time. It can fight off more than one at a time, but you have to have a specific defense for each one separately. All right, so let's talk about the first line defense systems. Okay, so the first line tries to prevent contact. So here you are in the middle. That's me when I was younger and prettier and skinnier. <laughs> Think of yourself a, in a castle, okay? You're the princess or the prince, and you are surrounded by the first line, the moat, the second line, the castle walls, and the other defense systems castles have, like the cannons and that kind of stuff. And then you're surrounded by your knights, okay, that are sworn to protect you no matter what. The first line of defense, the moat, okay, are things like your skin. Okay, your skin is dead, so that's protective. Sebaceous glands secrete oil that traps some bugs. Hair, um, sweat, mucus in your um, nose. Stomach acid is wonderful stuff. Kills anything, kills lots and lots of bugs when you swallow food covered with pathogens. You have a chemical called lysozyme in your tears that fight off bugs. You have reflexes like coughing, sneezing, vomiting, and diarrhea, which gross, but talk about a good way to get rid of lots of bugs all at one time. Okay, all of these things are excellent at protecting you. And they work all the time. Okay, and they're all the time protecting you, and you probably have tons of bugs contacting you every day that never make you sick because these things happen. Okay, so here you are. Your moat includes things like cilia, mucus, stomach acid, your skin, your hair, your sweat, your tears, vomiting, diarrhea, coughing, sneezing, protecting you against the bad guys. But if the bug gets across the first line defenses, you have the second line. And the second line is internal. These are things inside. Usually inflammation triggers all the second line defenses, which include your white blood cells doing phagocytosis, which is engulfing and destroying um, the bacteria, virus, whatever the pathogen is. Uh, natural killer cells, which are another kind of white blood cells that are activated uh, in the second line defense system. Cytokines, which are chemicals that are released to basically tell the immune system, hey, wake up, dude, we got something going on here. Um, there are chemicals released by white blood cells that activate them. Okay, one, of the, one of the cytokines is histamine. Histamine causes vasodilation, runny nose, mucus production. Um, you know if you have allergies because histamine is the evil chemical that causes all those side effects. Neutrophils, remember those are the Number one are the most abundant white blood cells, and they get activated and they go to the site where the inflammation is occurring and start to do phagocytosis and chop up the bad guys. Uh, fever is another thing, which fever um, makes you hot. It doesn't make you feel that great, but it fries the bugs. Bugs are, both pathogens are very sensitive to even a temperature of 100 or 101. And while it might not make us feel that great, it's really deadly to the bugs, which is good. Um, in fact, doctors are trying to get people not to treat a fever quite so quickly because it's a great way to kill bugs. It also causes uh, vasodilation and swelling and therefore pushing on nerves, causing pain. And nobody wants to feel pain, but it's a signal to us to slow down, take care of ourselves. Um, if it's a splinter, for example, the pain tells us where that splinter is so we can go digging for it or whatever. So these are all second line defenses and it's going to try to protect you from that bug multiplying and causing even more damage. So here's a little cartoon I found, the cardinal signs of inflammation, heat, redness, swelling, and pain. Okay, Which nobody wants these things, but it's a way to tell your body, hey, there's something wrong, you need to rest, you need to go get medical care, whatever you need to do. So there you are in your castle and you have the moat and you have the castle walls and the cannons and all these things going on trying to protect you from that bug. If the pathogen gets 
through this or is still living and multiplying and causing damage, hopefully the third line defense system is now waking up and is going to take note. These two lines of defense, the first and second, remember, are not specific. It doesn't matter what pathogen is trying to attack you, these will try to protect you. But the specific defense system is specific to one pathogen. And what it's specific to is a protein on that pathogen, or usually a protein, called an antigen. An antigen is any molecule which can trigger an immune response. Any molecule that can trigger an immune response is an antigen. And basically, any foreign molecule or any antigen has capable of doing this, and what you want your immune system to attack the foreign ones, the ones made by somebody else, not made by you. Okay. It also requires you to find that antigen or recognize that antigen as the bad guy. And the recognizing molecules or, or cells that do this are your T and B lymphocytes. Remember, lymphocytes was one of the kinds of white blood cells we briefly mentioned in the cardiovascular system. You have T cells and B cells, lymphocytes, that have receptors on them that are each a little bit different. So if you have 100,000 T cells, you have 100,000 different recognition rep receptors on those. Okay, so you got to find the T or the B cell with the matching receptor. It's got to find that antigen, recognize it as a bad dude, to to start this process. It's amazing to me that it even works, but sometimes this takes a couple of days. So in the meantime, you got to hope those first and second line defenses are working. All right, so you need B cells and T cells for the recognition to work. And then pretty much you have two simultaneous systems that are going on. Uh, if the B cell recognizes the antigen first, it triggers a production of antibodies. If the T cell finds uh, the antigen first, it triggers an army of T killer cells. But usually once one happens, the other seems to also happen. It's almost like one helps the other. So how does this work? What's an antigen? Usually it's a protein, and of course proteins have shape because remember, they fold up due to hydrogen bonds. Okay. If that antigen or that molecule or that protein is made by you, it's considered a self-antigen and it should not trigger an immune response because it's you. Okay? If it's made by another organism, it's considered a foreign antigen and that's the one you want to attack. So your immune system has to learn what's foreign and what's self. Okay? What's foreign and what's self. These antigens are recognized by T helper cells, T killer cells, or T lymphocytes, and B lymphocytes. Okay, because they have receptors that have different shapes, and you have to hope that you have one with the shape that matches any foreign antigen that you might be exposed to. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about these self antigens. You basically have little name tags on your cells that say, hi, my name is, mine would say, Michelle to tell your immune system, that's me, don't attack. On your red blood cells, those antigens are known as your blood type, A, B, and the RH factor. Whichever antigens you have, that's your blood type. Okay? So I have A positive blood. I have the A antigen and the RH antigen. If I had all three antigens on my blood cells, if I had A, B, and RH, I would have A, B positive blood. Okay, so the RH factor, if you have it, you're positive. It's just an antigen. All three of them are antigens. If you lack A and B, you don't have either one of those antigens, your blood type is referred to as O. There is no O antigen. I think O really meant zero, not having A or B. So your blood type is whatever antigens you have. If you don't have any antigens, you are O negative. Okay, so if you have the A antigen and the RH antigen, you have A positive blood. If you have no antigens at all, you're O negative. So on your red blood cells, your self antigens basically determine your blood type or are your blood type. On all your other cells, the cells that have nuclei, you have self antigens called MHC. 
major histocompatibility complex proteins. You don't have to remember that. <laughs> but basically, this is what you need to match if you had to donate an organ to somebody. Okay? Not only would you have to match blood type, but you'd have to match your MHCs. If you have identical twin, you got the perfect organ donor right there because you're going to have matching MHCs. Um, a biological sibling has a 1 in 4 chance of matching your MHCs. So, um, in some books, they are now referred to as HLAs. But regardless, they're the self-antigens on all your nucleated cells. So here's a picture of different, the different blood types. Notice the antigens are the black square, the gold triangle, or the blue triangle. AB positive would have all three antigens on the surface of their cell. The gold triangle, the blue triangle, and the black square. So they are A, B positive. I have A positive, so this is what I look like. I have the RH factor and the A antigen on the surface of my cells. Uh, my brother is O positive. He doesn't have any antigens, uh, any A or any B. He just has the RH factor, so he is O positive. You cannot get a blood type if you don't have that antigen. Okay, so I can't get anything with a B in it, because I don't have B. And to me, B is going to be foreign, and my immune system will attack it, causing my blood to clot, causing me to die. So I can't get anything with a B. I can get A positive, I can get A negative, I can get O positive or O negative, but I can't get anything with a B. Poor O negative can't get anything but O negative, because to an O negative person, A is foreign, B is foreign, and RH is foreign. You will be doing blood typing in lab, and hopefully this will be even more clear once you do that. But you can read about it online, type in blood typing if you want some more information. Okay, so your immune system's got to figure out which is the bad guys and which is the good guys. If they see your cell and, and recognize the antigens on it as self, that's great. It knows, okay, that's you, I'm not going to attack. Autoimmune diseases are when your immune system gets confused about this and starts to attack. Okay, rheumatoid arthritis, your immune system is attacking your synovial fluid. Okay, which really sucks because it's hard to treat. We have to suppress your immune system to treat it, which means you get sick from everything else because we're trying to slow down your immune response. If the immune cells, those B cells, B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes and T helper cells, see a pathogen with a foreign antigen on the surface, this is good that they recognize that as foreign, that will trigger the immune response. And now all kinds of cool things happen. And for T cell, or for the recognition part, you have uh, phagocytes that are eating the bugs. Remember, that's one of the things the second line defense does. And what they do is they take the antigens on that pathogen and they put it on their own cell surface. They are now antigen presenting cells. They run around and they bump into T helper cells hoping to find the one with the matching receptor. And when they do, they're like, hey, this bad dude's out there. Don't kill me. I'm just a messenger. But this antigen, it's on a bad dude and you need to trigger an immune response. And the activated T helper cell says, okay, I know what the bad guy looks like now. I'm going to activate the B and the T lymphocytes. So the T helper cell is involved in activation of both T and B cell mediated immunity. And this antigen presentation or recognition step is the one that takes the longest because you gotta hope these two cells just literally bump into each other with the matching receptor to that foreign antigen. In T cell mediated immunity, the T helper cell activates a T, a cytotoxic T cell with that same receptor, and it clones itself into an army of killer T's or T killer cells. These little dudes are like an army that only can shoot one pathogen. It can only shoot whatever triggered the, the immune response to start with. So if it was salmonella that infected you, this T killer cell can only kill salmonella. If it was the COVID virus, this T cell can only kill virus, uh, cells infected by the COVID virus. Okay, so it's specific to the pathogen. That is referred to as T cell mediated immunity. Along the way, not only do you get this 
Killer T army, you also end up with some uh, memory cells, memory T cells, that will stick around potentially forever even after the T killer army has gone away because once you kill all the pathogen the army goes away too. But these T cell memory cells will stick around and if Salmonella ever shows up again it clones itself back into a T killer cell army destroys the Salmonella usually before you even notice. This is why you don't get chickenpox again usually. If the immune response worked and you end up with memory cells it will destroy the virus before you get the itchy red spots again when it comes to chicken pox. At the same time that you have activation of T lymphocytes, you also have activation of B lymphocytes. B lymphocytes, when they're activated by the T helper cell, clone themselves into plasma cells. Plasma cells produce antibodies. This little purple dude here is blowing out antibodies, always in the shape of Ys. The antibodies are released into solution and they bind only the antigen that triggered the response to start with. So if it was the salmonella antigen, it will bind anything that's got that salmonella antigen attached to it, whether the antigen is free in solution or attached to the bacteria. So you see the little Ys attaching uh, to the antigen. And they don't kill directly, but they mark them for death. If you're coated with antibodies, other macrophages and neutrophils think you're lunch and will eat you. So the T killer cells, back on the previous slide here, they directly kill anything with that antigen. B cell mediated immunity produces antibodies which mark for death. Okay, so between the two, you're gonna wipe that pathogen right out of your body. And again, you end up with some B memory cells which will clone themselves into plasma cells if they ever see that particular antigen again which is again why we usually don't get the same disease twice. Okay, so now here you are, you have uh, first line defenses and second line defenses and your knights are specific to you and you have B knights and T knights end up with antibody production from B uh, cells and T killer cells out of your T lymphocytes and between the two it usually saves you. And this works. You know, all of us usually are able to fight off diseases pretty well. Okay, so it's kind of cool how the immune system works. And obviously, there's way more information than I talked about. You can get a degree just in immunology if you're interested in the immune system. All right, last but not least, passive versus active immunity. If you get a disease, or you get vaccinated, either one, you get the antigen or the antigen is exposed in your body and your immune system, you end up with memory cells and the ability to make antibodies and T killer cells. You have active immunity if you can make your own antibodies. If you got the antibodies from somebody else, like through mom because you were nursing um, or from some antibodies cross the placenta, you have passive immunity because somebody else made the antibodies. Okay, so you can get the antigen naturally or you can get it injected. That's what a vaccine is. It gives you an antigen that's not able to replicate but can trigger an immune response. You have active immunity. If you got the antibodies from somebody else, you can't make your own, that's passive immunity. And again, it's usually naturally from mom, although you can get antibody injections we have antibodies against hepatitis B and rabies, um, and there might be one more. They have used it to treat COVID. They get antibodies from somebody else, and sometimes that works. Um, but mostly, you have active immunity, okay? Because either you got sick or you've been vaccinated against that disease. Now, if you get the antigen or antibodies by a shot medically, that's considered artificial. So you can have artificial active or natural active immunity depending on whether you got the disease, that's natural, or whether you got the antigen injected by a vaccine. So when I was five, I had chicken pox. I have natural active immunity against chicken pox. 
but I got the vaccine for measles, mumps, and rubella. So I have artificial active immunity against those two. I got passive immunity when I was nursing, um, but after that, I have never been given antibodies in, either medically or pap, you know, medically would be artificial. So basically you have four types of immunity. Active means you can make your own antibodies. You can have natural active immunity from having the disease or artificial active immunity from having a vaccine. Your body doesn't know once the antigen is inside of you, whether it came from the little kid next door, you got it naturally, or you were given a shot. Your immune system reacts absolutely the same because it doesn't know where it got the antigen from. Passive immunity is when you get the antibodies made from somebody else, naturally from mom or artificially by injection. Okay, let's review. Why can't you get B positive blood if you're A positive? Okay. Do you know? Hopefully you said because B to an A positive person would be foreign and your immune system would attack. The body doesn't know where an antigen comes from, so getting chickenpox versus getting the chickenpox vaccine looks the same to your immune system. Would you end up with memory cells in both cases? The answer is yes. Okay, that's why you only need to be vaccinated once or twice for a disease, because you end up with memory cells. So I have memory T and B cells against measles, mumps, and rubella. T helper cells are needed in the activation of both B and T cell mediated immunity. The HIV virus slowly infects and destroys T helper cells. What does this mean for people with HIV? People with HIV can be HIV positive and not yet have AIDS, but once their T helper cells go down below a certain number, then they're diagnosed as AIDS or having AIDS because now their immune system, their third line immune system, doesn't work. Without T helper cells, you cannot activate B or T lymphocytes. You never get antibodies and you never get T killer cells. So you die from infectious diseases that you can't find, fight off, which is kind of a bummer. Okay, I have some great links there. If you want some uh, more help with the immune system, um, check out the movie online, Holly Gets the Flu. It's a good one to explain the specific immune response. And as always, please feel free to email me if you have any questions.